welcome to Qubytes, your bite-sized pieces of quantum computing. My name is Rene from Alarm Reply, and today we're going to talk about quantum computing for life sciences and pharma. And for this, I'm very honored to have a special expert guest today, Ivan Ostojic. Hi, Ivan, and welcome to the show. How are you today? Hi, uh, I'm very good. Thank you for having me. It's a real pleasure to talk to you. Perfect. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about yourself and your background as it relates to quantum computing? Yes, uh, my name is uh, Ivan. I'm a partner in McKinsey in Zurich, and uh, my background is that I lead our quantum group within McKinsey globally. I have kind of dual background, life science, um, uh, biophysics, uh, where I also did a lot of analytics, and then the other one is technology innovation uh, uh, management. So I'm looking at a lot of emerging technologies within McKinsey, and I got I felt in love with quantum. I think the power of technology to transform um, uh, many industries is immense, and it can help us uh, solve some burning problems uh, for humanity. Absolutely, and that's that's what we're actually going to talk about. And so let's dive into today's topic. So, like you mentioned, you work at McKinsey on on life science, pharmaceutical and uh, also work with other chemical industries and so on, right? And so what are some of the challenges these industries are currently facing when it comes to computation and computational power, right? And how can quantum computing help to overcome these challenges? Yeah, so at the moment, if you look at the pharma value chain, I think um, there are essentially one huge uh, barrier to entry to this industry, which is, which is around R&D. And this um, R&D uh, at the moment is kind of undergoing disruption because a lot of knowledge that was implicit in scientists, you know, picking the right molecule and so forth, is becoming explicit to use or, uh, through use of artificial intelligence, by new molecular targets, et cetera, et cetera. However, there is a computational challenge in that piece, especially around chemistry, because you know, taking human out of equation and, and doing kind of in silico modeling of chemistry has progressed, but not to the extent that we can automate this. So, so that's one thing where really quantum has a huge promise. The second one is as machines get stronger and we're probably talking or um, more powerful, we're probably talking some decades ahead. But actually, we have a chance to move pharma um, uh, from real kind of experimentation to real in silico. A little bit what <clears throat> happened to automotive industry, like some decades ago, you know, when you when you wanted to do a, a kind of a, a crash test for a car, you had to do everything manually, and now you can simulate. So I think we can simulate a lot of things in human, whether molecules are toxic. We see it already with AI, but I think uh, quantum computing would bring that on a on a whole um, different level. So to summarize, I think in R and D, it's the chemistry, and we can go much more into details. And I think it's it's a lot around biology and interaction between. Um, molecules and the body that we will be able to simulate to understand the effects. And then just to wrap up this whole thing, although I focus on R&D because that's kind of imminent opportunity for quantum, um, if we think of complex optimizations from production to logistics supply chain, and even you know through um, uh, some commercial interactions some opt and, and helping doctors uh, choose the right drug for right patient and optimize the treatments, all of these are areas where, where quantum computing algorithms can play a role, especially optimization ones. So I think, I think you know, the, the effect could be end-to-end, -end, but I think the, the first immediate or imminent opportunity is in R&D. So this is amazing. So basically you can um, apply quantum computing to pharmaceutical, especially for the chemical processing side. Could you also say, like, since, you know, chemistry, if you're actually going down how, you know, all these smallest particles interact with each other, like atoms and, you know, subatomic particles, you're actually dealing with quantum mechanics, right? And so yes. if you're kind of simulating this um, quantum mechanics, of course, it's better to simulate those on a quantum computer, right? Because you're closer to the real thing. Is that fair to say? It's fair to say. So if I may just come back, it, it's not really how we make molecules. Um, that is the important part. But if you understand deeply pharma, there is something like, let me just explain for your audience who is not expert in pharma on a high level. So first, you need to find your target, which is the molecule in your body that you are targeting with the <sighs> drug, where the biological effect will happen. Once you find the target, you need to find the optimal lead. And at the moment, it's a very kind of manual process where you are screening like tens of thousands of different chemicals in order to find an optimal hit. Hit means this molecule is binding to, to this 
uh, molecule in your body that will have biological effect. And then once you find a hit, then you need to, that's called lead molecule, you need to optimize that lead molecule using uh, different chemical methods. And that process is very manual today. And I think now coming back to your follow-up question, if we use quantum computing, first of all, at the moment, we are limited to the libraries of chemicals that we already have. With quantum computer, we can kind of extrapolate. Um, we don't need machine learning to learn on past molecules. We can actually literally simulate you know, molecular structures. So finding hits will be easier and be, be much more assisted. And then what is known, as I explained, lead optimization. So optimizing that molecule to be soluble, to get into the body, to be less toxic, to have higher affinity, all of that, I believe, can be done much better by use of, of sort of quantum computing. Thanks. Makes a lot of sense. And regarding the uh, the impact you're already seeing today, so can you share a little bit, you know, what are some of the impact we're already seeing today with things like quantum-inspired computing? And do you have an example, maybe? Yes, I have two examples. And so just not to overhype technology, right? I, I, I'm very cautious about that so that we manage expectations appropriately. I mean, at the moment, you know, there is no applications in pharmaceutical on a let's say, um, especially in chemistry on a real quantum hardware. However, you are absolutely right. Quantum inspired algorithms, which means, um, as most of your audience will know, but I'll just say it's, 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 it's quantum inspired. So these algorithms are running on a, on a conventional mach machines or in a um, you know, certain hardware configuration of conventional machines. Or we have seen that a couple of pharmaceutical companies have found fairly promising applications that actually generated some real impact. So let me give you two examples. One is around protein-protein uh, interactions and protein optimizations um, using, um, you know, combination of quantum annealers and um, the uh, uh, high-performing computing sequence that can optimize certain interactions or help scientists understand. And the other is quantum-inspired algorithms in the uh, what is known as CAD screening, so essentially chemical compound screening uh, right. and modeling to match um, uh, ligands, meaning the ke small chemical mo molecules with target proteins. These are like biological molecules in your body. Uh, there actually people have made some breakthroughs generating um, uh, a whole workflows uh, to improve that screening using quantum inspired algorithms. And apparently it's, I mean, there are proofs, um, uh, this is coming from some of our clients, uh, uh, so, uh, but there are proofs actually that that this produces uh, superior results, the quantum inspired algorithms than conventional, let's say, artificial intelligence or machine learning algorithms. So, very interesting and exciting that we already see some early proof points. Yeah, yeah agreed. And uh, maybe to also add another uh, example, I was just talking with. Um, a friend actually for another Qubytes episode about quantum machine learning, right? And he was basically saying the same thing. It's like, even with these small quantum computers, you can build like hybrid AI models like neural networks. And at a higher layer, you can basically inject a, a quantum layer. And uh, even with like, you know, when you already have the features extracted, you can basically use that quantum layer to give you better accuracy for image recognition yeah. and so on, right? Because it's more in a probabilistic nature. It's amazing. I do. I do believe that that strongly that the first application will be exactly like that. You will you will have to devise the complex workflows, which would contain you know high performance uh, computing sequences of, of of algorithms that would, as you said, extract feature, prepare them. Then you'll run certain things on a on a quantum or quantum inspired algorithms to get either higher accuracy or to solve certain things that you couldn't solve classically. And then once the you know the problem is cracked. You can you can pull it back into normal high performance computing um, sequence. I think that's the probably first, you know, um, first areas of application. And then depending when we have full tolerant quantum computer, we'll be probably be able to do much more on chemistry side. Gotcha. That makes a lot of sense. And um, IBM just announced they built. Um, I think they're leading the game now. I think 127 qubit computer. They just built that one. And they're planning to do a um, 433 qubit quantum computer as a next step. But they're approaching pretty fast, right? So um, since you're also very well versed in the whole quantum computing world, let's let's talk about also the general health of the ecosystem and your future perspective. Because you talk a lot with, with clients in the industry, so I, I'm, I would appreciate um, your thoughts on that. So where are you seeing the, the biggest blockers at the moment for further adoption in general, but especially in these industries? 
And, and what's going to happen in the next couple of years in terms of use cases and you know how to accelerate growth in the ecosystem? Yeah, so I think, I mean, couple. let's call it a couple of blockers. Uh, first of all, um, I don't know if it's a blocker, but it's an opportunity. I think we need this kind of more integrated working across the whole ecosystem. So what I mean by that, I call it mission teams. You know, if we would have, um, let's call it like, uh, in, if we talk about life science, pharmaceutical companies working with specific, you know, quantum hardware companies and then uh, software communities uh, end to end in order to um, define valuable problems to solve with quantum computing on a specific level such that, that quantum scientists can convert that into algorithms um, and then, you know, try to execute with expectation to learn. I don't think we can have huge expectation at this moment. Uh, and I, th I think that's number one. And I, I know that there are pharma groups like Q Farm and so forth already working on it. But I think this would really accelerate uh, all learning and understanding what's missing and so forth. Number two, I think, you know, um, at least in Europe, where both of us are, we have gap in funding that we need to close in order to further, further accelerate. But maybe that's not the biggest problem. The third biggest problem I'll mention is, is talent. And I, I think talent both on corporate side, but also on quantum application side. So what I mean by corporate side, uh, the main breakthrough in artificial intelligence happened when we built a, a, a kind of a, 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 a pool of people who we call uh, translators. So the people who actually quite understood artificial intelligence or machine learning very well, but they, they knew the industry in depth. And I think we need that pool for quantum in order to help pharmacos, you know, identify the use cases and define you know, parameters of solution space in order so that quantum science application scientists and then and then, you know, even already in our modeling, uh, we see a, a huge gap in talent on a quantum side because, I mean, you know, master programs and so forth are just emerging and writing quantum code or harder, as you know yourself and your audience, it's not a trivial thing. So I think these are the main three things. If you ask me about uh, sort of um, hardware uh, milestones and development, I think a, we should be cautious not to overhype technology because if we raise expectation and don't deliver, that's a huge, let's say, um, it will delay us in terms of corporates who will say, oh, it's overhyped and adoption will slow down. And the second thing is, you know, uh, we should be patient with this uh, hardware milestones, although, you know, we see qubit counts and different things increasing. I mean, the jury is out and there is a big debate among, um, we have our McKinsey Technology Council where we have a lot of competing companies in, in quantum that are discussing, and there is a huge, um, let's say, debate, are we able to do something in this, uh, what people kind of label as NISC era or not? So meaning, are we going to get some useful um, use cases until we have higher uh, order of, of error correction or not? And I think, I think uh, while that jury might still be out, we still have quantum simulators. We can develop algorithms. We can understand if certain things will work and so forth. So instead of you know, overhyping and going in that direction, I would rather more focus on fundamental groundwork like some companies are doing to actually, uh, you know, develop algorithms and prove that certain cases can be used. So I think my sequence to elevate a lot of words that I used up would be, let's define useful problems, let's build communities that will work on this, and then actually let's first work on algorithm development in a simulated environment to understand, you know, how much capacity we'll need, what are prerequisites and can we theoretically solve those problems? I think that will be actually pretty good proof points that technology will work already. And I think that's probably what we should focus at the moment, um, at the moment uh, in order to drive this. Fully agreed. I mean, like what you're saying, it definitely makes a lot of sense. And uh, like also like the, the point you made about talent and, you know, that there's a lack of skilled workforce, if you, if you will, um, but not just like, like you said, not just like quantum physicists with a PhD, but the whole stack, right? You need also these people in between that are domain experts on both sides a little bit, but can, can like you said, translators this is a perfect description of that. And that's what we're also trying to do with this show, right? Making it more approachable and trying to, to, to provide like, you know, um, a way that you can understand the impact, like, you know, our audience can understand the impact and we can share what's already possible today and build also this community a little bit. Yeah. So thank you so much for joining us today and sharing your insights. That was fantastic. Very much appreciated, Ivan. Thank you for having me. I enjoy your shows and I like really this short um, um, qubit um, 
you know, uh, uh, talks so people, we can bring a little bit like in simple language into into the discussions. Um, I really enjoyed the conversation and um, I hope you found it useful. It was awesome. And thanks everyone for joining us for another episode of Qubytes, your bite-sized pieces of quantum computing. Uh, watch our blog, follow our social media channels to hear all about the next episodes and also to find out the previous episodes, of course. Well, thanks again. Take care and see you soon. Bye-bye.